the PJ selection was these these candidates rolling over each other in like a pit of like that foam or whatever. Uh, and you're not allowed to puke in it. So <laughs> you got to puke in your hand, <laughs> like take it on the outside. And the instructors are like, clean up your puke. <laughs> Welcome to episode 51 of the Rescue Swimmer Mindset Podcast. I am joined by Brendan Deckard, today a Air Force pararescue jumper, as well as Cody Wright, my co-host. Welcome, Brendan. Thanks for coming. Hey, guys. Yeah, thanks Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, so we, we were just talking briefly just now about the, the Rescue Swimmer motto, So Others May Live, which is very comparable to the Air Force PJ model of our uh, motto of these things we do that others may live. Um, so which one did we decide was the first <laughs> to, to adopt that similar model? I think we're going to say that we, we stole it. <laughs> the source stole it, you know? <laughs> the swimmer, yeah. Like, the PJs initiated it, but the, yeah, the swimmers it. made it their own. <laughs> yeah. That's what it seems like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, let's, let's dive into a little bit of the, Air Force PJ history before we dive into yours, Brendan. So when did uh, the Air Force PJs start? So like timelines and all that stuff, like I'm, I'm probably not your guy to like give you, you know, the specific details on that. I just, I do know that like we talked about kind of like the medical field and stuff like that. PJ is kind of like starting the, the history there in like 1940s realm. Um, but as far as like the whole, you know, Roman Beret, you think you do as they live, all that, all that jazz, um, I was like Vietnam era. Um, and then like we were kind of talking about earlier specifically because like you guys needed to be able to go into those, um, that terrain, like that canopy of the trees and everything out there that was just so hard that they'd use these devices, force penetrators, that we can go in, drop in, and grab a guy, get out like real quick. Um, and then we were established a lot on the ideas or the thoughts and the backs of like smoke jumpers actually which is kind of interesting for our history that like that's where we kind of developed yeah it's a pretty big canadian job the smoke jumpers <laughs> that that's like that's like such a that's like the civilian um yeah like special operations if you will but they don't get paid anything they like uh, yeah, if, you, if you're a smoke jumper it's ridiculous yeah and i got some actually good buddies that are they double as you know uh pjs in the go on the guard or reserve side but then they're smoke jumpers because initially i got in that's what i wanted to do so i got i just deployed with one he was out there he's a smoke jumper and he's telling me like to pay he's like yeah it's, i love that job but i gotta do something else yeah what well, it's like i think i i guess it's seasonal more or less so but i think yeah, it's, it's what like 30 grand maybe so it's like sometimes it'll start out that low and you know sometimes you can get up to a lot higher like depending on the areas you're in like california is making a lot more than the oregon uh smoke jumpers like it's like a difference of 20 20 to 30 K starting out versus like 60, 60 K starting out. Like it's a pretty good jump. Wow. I don't, yeah. yeah. Uh, let's, let's, let's get out of the smoke jumper history and, yeah, and get yeah, into yeah. The, so, to yeah. your history of becoming a PJ. So yeah. What, what got you into that career path? Cause you know, personally I think like, or, or even the public, I think we're kind of more in the, uh, the knowledge of Navy SEALs, Green Berets. They're always depicted in either like cinema cinema or, you know, on the, on the media, but the air force PJ are kind of like the unsung heroes. So what, what got you into that field? Yeah. And sorry to jump back to the smoke jumper thing, but I actually, that's all I ever wanted to do was all I ever wanted to be was a smoke jumper since I was like a little kid. So I actually went to college trying to figure it out. I couldn't go on that route with like college. So I got out, like, didn't know what to do. Um, thought maybe like firefighting in the military, that'd be a good idea. My buddy, who's actually a, a Navy rescue, uh, diver, one of those guys. And he, um, he was like, dude, go PJ. Like, I wish I could go back in time and go PJ. And I didn't know what it was. So I walked into the recruiters 
they told me what it like they do and everything. And I heard like medicine and I was like, all right, I'm on board, like, let's do it. So that's how I like discovered it. Like I didn't see anything, you know, and like, on paper and in the, like online or anything, you know, I don't find anything about it there. It's just from, from people telling me about it. I don't know. Yeah. So, so what, you just walked into like a, an air force recruiter after that or. Yeah. So I, I literally just walked in and the guy was like, he was like, Hey man, like you want to go PJ? Like, do you know anything about, do you know how to swim? Cause like, it's a big thing. And I was like, yeah, I swim in college. He was like, all right, you're going, I'm going to sign you up. You're going to go, you're going to do that. Because, like, it's really good for them as recruiters to, like, put in uh, the Battlefield. I think, actually, they changed the name, but, like, that Battlefield Airmen, like, group, whether it's TACP, CCTs, uh, SR now, or the PJs. It's, like, really good for them, too. So, they're, like, really pushing to get guys into these uh, careers. Nice. Did you have to pre-qualify for that, like a PT test or something, or was it just kind of – um, yeah yeah you got to take uh you got to take like a pre-test for physical for it so there's yeah. like there's running push-ups pull-ups all that stuff yeah. um just to get there and then again you got to do it like when right before you start um what used to be in doc it's called the pass test so it's just right like, yeah what was the hardest part of that test for you that, that's it well for me like growing up i've been a swimmer since i was like five and my joints do not handle running well at all <laughs> i'm just not a runner so that was like timeline wasn't bad but like i would just come out broken from, from just running what was the run run was a 947 for a mile and a half like it's nothing you know insane but oh, that's that's faster than the rescue swimmers yeah I mean, that's the minimum yeah that's the 947 is like the minimum time you have to reach yeah like you have to be fast. yeah that's fast so also like these times and stuff, like all these things changed. I'm fairly certain. Like I, like I kind of told, mentioned to you guys earlier, like I don't actually know what happened, like what's now going on. Cause everything changed from what I went through. Yeah. Cause I did it like four years ago and they're starting to do this new thing called ANS versus Indoc. So a lot of these standards have, have shifted. Yeah. What, what is it now? Like, uh, is it, ta- is it Tapas or the PJ selection model or those two different things or. Yeah, no. So it's, there's, so like when you get in, you get a slot as a battlefield airman or whatever it is. So you can, you go into basic as like, you know, a battlefield airman or or whatever they call it now. And you go to um, this course like battlefield airman prep or the prep course. And you do all these tests, all these uh, physical activities and all this stuff and they kind of they kind of there decide like for you kind of hey you're gonna be a pj or hey you're gonna go the cct route and from that point then you move into these different selections which now for pjs is ans um which used to be in doc interesting yeah yeah um yeah so i i kind of my like a little research on it, it it does definitely seem like it's more tailored towards you know hey is your personality fit for our teams more so than like hey can you crank out the the minimum requirements like oh sure you're like you're physically fit but can you withstand like can you work well as a team yeah it's uh, and it's what i'm hearing from uh, some like of the leadership at my unit here that have like gone and watched it and actually physically were there. I think they've taken some good things and really put it into this new program and it's like really benefiting, but I also think they took out some huge positives of the old NDOC and the old selection process. They like took them out and that, and like put in some questionable things depending on who you are. Um, like what the pit of puke the pit of puke yeah i mean we don't really have to get too much into it just because i really don't know too much about it sure there's like there's phases where like it just it's just different <laughs> right yeah so wait what what is that because like i i what's that what was that show like surviving the cut of course i i, nice. I took a, i took a glance at that and oh, uh weird. what is that like you guys that training where you guys roll and actively like a lot of folks puke and so, you gotta get out. Surviving the cut. Yeah. So I actually didn't. Well, I haven't watched a lot of these these prior PJ videos. You know. Yeah. Um. So if that's like, if I'm if I'm 
track in that's you're talking about the video of like basically the indoctrination course and it was a bunch of different clips of like <laughs> <I'll be honest>. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that's, that's always stuck with me like as the the stand out in the survivor they cut you i never really watched the show much but the only thing that really stood out with me was this in the i believe it was the pj selection was these these candidates are rolling over each other in like a pit of like that foam or whatever. Uh, and you're not allowed to puke in it. So <laughs> you've got to puke in your hand. <laughs> like take it on the outside. And the instructors are like, clean up your puke. <laughs> I mean, hey, I, I didn't, I didn't go through that. Um, okay. As society changes, obviously we're changing too. So like things are, it's one of those, yeah, one of those drills that got phased out. Yeah, this, <laughs> Damn. Yeah. <laughs> phased out and continue to get phased out. Damn, seemed like a classic. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. I'm, bad. I'm sad I missed that. Yeah. So let's go back to like the, the physical challenges of, of graduating through the pipeline. What was your, aside from running, um, how about what's the biggest challenge for the average candidate? Yeah, so you see guys fall out a lot due to injuries, um, whether it's through indoc with like a huge one, is, you know, shin splints, hernias, just from that amount of physical like stress on your body, you guys get injured all the time. That's a huge one. Um, and then talking about just the pipeline itself, so past you know that selection course, a huge um, a huge issue or a huge uh, hill is paramedic, like just getting through the paramedic school. Cause we do, we don't go through like that Sockham course and everything we go through. If we used to, they changed it, but we used to go through UNM. So university of New Mexico, and we actually were enrolled at the university of New Mexico as students taking right. the paramedic course. We were on base doing it at our own place, but we we're actually enrolled students there. And that was tough because like, you're going from, you know, everything military to then you're just going back to school and <laughs> you're like, Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah that was a big that was a big issue for a lot of guys and then um outside of those you know injuries and that and then that was those were the two biggest yeah how many people fail out of the like after like the initial selection how many people end up failing out in the pipeline um like what would you say is like the rate so like i'll give it from like the beginning to the end as far as my class we had See, we had we had two classes end up combining at my indoc. So we ended up with like, if you combine the two from the beginning, we had like 160 people start, and we had like 35 graduate at the end of indoc, and that was the biggest class ever. Like the next biggest before that was like 18. Right. And then um, we had a couple dropouts. Like I think we had three or four at our dive school, which came next. And then you go through paramedic and everything. And we had like another five guys. So about post end we had about seven guys drop out from those. And it's not like they're just dropping out the whole thing. They just get recycled to the next. All right. Okay. Yeah. And then, um, and then again, uh, PJU, the final step we had, I think it ended up being seven guys fall out from our team. So you like, you're continuously like losing small numbers. But a lot of times they just get recycled back. They fix their issues and then they progress past that. Some guys fall out, but it's not, you know, like completely they're gone, but it's not after indoc or after ANS. It's not nearly as much. Like it's like 90% of, or it used to be like 90% attrition at indoc. And then it was like a 90% pass rate after that. Right. Yeah. Right. Makes sense. Yeah. Is it, I'm assuming it's kind of heartbreaking because, you know, ourselves, whenever we have, other rescue swimmer candidates fail out after you know two months that was kind of dude you lost like you lost a part of your team but you guys are together for like an even longer period of time so how does it feel after like so long and losing somebody yeah i mean i have buddies that like i went through not only in doc but basic training with that we've been for a long time and we got to the very end like the very, we were in PJU, it was at the very end, and, and these guys failed out of that and got recycled back to the next class. So it's like, it's bitter, you know, bittersweet. It's like, oh, damn, we're losing them. But hey, they're going to be on the next class and they're going to graduate just a couple of months after in the grand scheme of things, a couple of months. No, yeah, big, no deal. big deal, for sure. What is, what is PJU? It's the final, like, course that we go through that basically is, is our uh, apprenticeship. 
So it's just teaching us PJ skills. So all the all the schools we went through prior, we're now incorporating that into a course that involves like the actual PJs and the operation operations of it. Yeah. Mission. Now, like uh, you mentioned a lot of things just now, like one of the things was dive school. And I always thought that was one of like the coolest sounding schools. Uh, is that the same school that like the, is it the other Navy social? School? F- yeah. So we do our, we have our own air force side. We're at the Navy, um, diamond salvage training center. We get, so some guys go there, some guys go to Key West and do it with army. Um, but like, it's our own, if you go to the Navy one, it's our own air force run program. It's just at the same site. So like we're there same time, like EOD's there. Um, a lot of times we're sit, we're there with like recon Marines while they're doing their dive course too. Right on. Same time, but different programs. Yeah. Cause the coast guard even goes through Panama city. Now we have a dive unit now or a yeah. dive rate. So I think I'm sure they have some sort of totally separate program, but it's Panama yeah. city. Yeah. Nice. Is that the one where like they tie up your, your, I should know. I, I actually, I'm a diver too. I mean, like, I'm a I'm a recreational diver too. <laughs> like yeah. <the> regulator, <laughs> like yeah. tied up. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they do that at that course for sure. We do uh, what's called one man's. So you spend I can't remember the timeline, but it was like a good good like ten minutes or so, and you're underwater. And in initial phases, they just um, they just hit you. They put like they're just bashing you essentially, like. Some of these videos that you can find online are actually pretty funny and comical for what they're doing down there. Cause it's, especially cause guys will go in almost like, you know, you just graduated in doc, you're feeling like, you know, confident and instructor slash student roles are a little different. It's still like, you know, intimidating, but you're a little more confident. So like some guys are like talking crap to the instructors. Like <laughs> some guys are like, Oh, am I going to get you for this one, man? Oh yeah. Easy day. You know, and then the instructors will just <laughs> on them. Are those, is that course run by uh, PJs also, or is it just Navy or is it Air Force divers or like who runs that course? Who are the instructors? We had, we had uh, prior like Navy corpsmen. We had Air Force PJs. We had Air Force CCTs as well running it. Okay. Um, just some contract, like you know, contract civilian um, divers running it too. They're just pong guys. Gotcha. Yeah. That sounds pretty fun. Um, Another cool one that I found out that you guys do is you go through like a rock climbing course as well. Is that, is that accurate? (laughs) Yes. No, like we do, we do a ropes course. Like that's in PJU. That's like at the end when you're going through the whole, let's incorporate everything. You actually go through what we call uh, the ropes course. Why I say it's not climbing is because we're not actually really ever climbing. Like, yes, that's a skill set that we do have and we do practice, but Mainly our stuff is like, you know, belaying people down or lowering instead of like in repelling instead of like climbing up. It's just like moving people. So either hauling them up or, you know, putting them like lowering them down, repelling ourselves down. We're not like physically climbing. Yeah. Cause you never really have to like go climb a rock face to get yeah. to a survivor. You'd always get lowered from a helicopter or something like that. Yeah. Or yeah. Off from the cliff. Like you yeah, just exactly. Like, you just repel from the cliff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know. What if you're like pinned down and you need to like evac out of this canyon, <laughs> you know? And then, yeah, there's no, there's no backup. <laughs> All right. That'd be a pretty uh, niche. Yeah. That'd be a niche case. Do you guys, uh, then, then correct me if this one's wrong, then what about Arctic training? Do you guys go through something like that? Yeah. A lot of times you do that. Like once you graduate. So I'm actually doing an Arctic survival course here um in i believe like later in the year like later 21 like march or sometime but um we're going to like we'll be in like little switzerland in alaska like you go to some pretty cold places and we're actually just going to get dropped out they're just leaving us we're going to get dropped in by uh 47 stage 47 and then they're just going to take off we're just going to spend a week there nice surviving that's so, pretty like, cool. Yeah. So we'll get that. We'll do that course now that I'm already like graduated. That usually happens then, but not usually while you're in. I mean, you go through SEER, the survival course that, oh, yeah. you know, a whole bunch of people go through, but it's not like an actual Arctic course. I hear that SEER is a pretty uh, fun one too. I mean, I had a blast because I was with really like good dudes and good friends. Um, I went through actually with a bunch of tech peas and those guys were awesome. But, uh, I mean, it's just, 
like you get you get a, a whole multitude of people that go through that course between pilots and you know air crew like loadies and stuff and then us and some other people like it's it's a good course it's fun so um i heard this story by some coast guardsmen that that have gone and they told us a story of apparently years ago navy seals att- oh, i mean they always attend but uh navy seals were there and i guess yeah you're on this kind of fortified base and you're it's it's a simulated scenario where you know you've been uh apprehended by somebody and they're they're kind of like i guess like torching you and that's that's what the whole uh course is about but i guess what these navy seals did is they were able to take like take over the situation this this training system and they pin down i guess the instructors are like lock them into the cells that they were initially in and then and then evacuated the base which i i guess is like far-ish out there because like they take you to like this remote location this is all from this story by the way so i don't know you correct me but um so anyway these navy seals are like took over the instructors put them in a cell booked it off base i think they got mcdonald's came back and then when the relief instructors came the the navy seal candidates were just like sitting there eating their mcdonald's (laughs) with the instructors (laughs) in the cell (laughs) yeah i mean there's uh there's seal courses kind of like not all throughout the states but like there's different areas seals go to a different uh location um a lot of times like for us yeah we did that whole um like it was you know an evasion phase of it in the beginning where you go through this whole like survival evasion where they're searching you and you're just trying to get out in this like little area that they have out in the out in like out in Spokane, like up up north, and some of the the uh, like in the forest out there, and you're evading, and then they you you don't evade, like they end up capturing you, and then they put you in a in a prison in this little cell, and then they start doing the whole torture thing and getting you in groups, and yeah, I mean they they do their best. I mean, there's definitely times where we had like guys just walk out. They were like, oh, no one's around. Okay, I'm gonna walk out. You know, they're like, wait, 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 don't leave. Like, you got to do the course. Like, you can't just walk out of here. Like, let's get the training value out of it. All right, you guys, you guys won, you left, but come on back. Um, <laughs> I've heard that happens a lot. I saw that happen actually. It's pretty funny, but um, the the seals go somewhere else. So I actually don't. I couldn't talk on their piece because they do it somewhere not where we do it. What well, would like? you know, our company is called the rescue swimmer mindset. What would you say is like the mindset of somebody going the PJ route versus another elite military, uh, career? I mean, the mindset's pretty, pretty standard. Like you, like, especially working with everybody, there is difference between the soft groups and like that versus the regular air force or, you know, army and all that stuff there is a different mindset there that you can see but like and working with seals or when we like work with other units tech peas or any other you know people like it's all everybody's pretty much similar mindset everyone's got the same like headspace as far as just uh work and everything but um yeah you don't notice too much of a difference until you look outside of that soft and you're like well, it's a different world true yeah so you're what like you're, you're a year through the pipeline now right yeah, I graduated in August 2019. So what's the future looking like for you? Man, I don't I don't actually know too much. I know I got some uh the the space flight rescue stuff coming up. So the whole like SpaceX and Boeing that are doing their little missions and stuff. Uh one of our teams, my like my team at the unit is uh on the hook for it. So I did the last one that just came in. I'm actually wearing like the shirt for Bob and Doug, the astronauts that came down. Um, we were out in Hawaii, uh, waiting to, if they crash landed in the Pacific, like that, we were on the hook to go pick them up. We had a team down in North Carolina to pick them up. And then SpaceX has their own, you know, thing that's picking them up, man. If those guys, if we have to pick them up though, that's a super bad day. Cause like those guys are landing on a moving boat out on the water. Like it's pretty impressive on some of those things. Like, that's so gnarly. yeah, if we're picking them up, especially in the Pacific, like, that's a bad day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Man, that's, but that's 
that's our future. Like we got, we got some deployments coming up, but everything being canceled, you know, and things like reducing force and everything out there, we're getting a lot of questions on whether or not certain, like some teams are going to deploy it or not, or if they're staying, because everything's just a question right now. Ah, so like COVID's greatly affecting the deployments. So this like not COVID, just like the reduction of force. So like we're we're, yeah, shutting, this, down, we're shutting down bases. There's less going on out there. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been hearing that. Yeah, I guess like a bunch of the pipelines are kind of backed up right now with people just because this, they don't just make people fill in the spaces. Yeah, I mean it's we're losing we're losing like a one of the bases we've been out there for a long time, and they're already pulling us a ton of forces out of Iraq alone. Like it's just not, we're not putting bodies out there anymore. So what, what is your perspective on like as a junior member, of course, uh, as to like troops being in Iraq and I think even still Afghanistan, like what, what is our, the mission currently over there? So, well, I mean, with my view personally, like dude, send me out there. Yeah. Give me, give me your view. Yeah. Yeah, the, the young PJ. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm a young PJ. Like, send me out there. I'll stay out there for as long as you need me. You know, let me come home every, you know, for a couple months. Like, I got a girlfriend here. I, I got to see and my dog and my family. But I'm a young PJ. Like, I need that experience. I want to get out there and I want to do it. And that's pretty much a lot of the new, like, young guys would have the same opinion. And we're just, they're shutting everything down. So I'm like, oh, yeah. You know, but, uh, like, the PJ, like, um, mission there's a ton of different views and, and there's a lot smarter people out there especially on pjs itself that can speak to what we should be doing my thought is more like hey we got we should start moving into more of a soft role and start attaching or even just within within the air force itself start doing like the the, the 18 series start building shred outs for us with combining tactics cct's ourselves and sr as teams well you just used a lot of words buddy we we got oh, sorry yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we've got like you got combat control you have pjs you have special reconnaissance and you have the tac p's so with cct's and tac p's like a lot a lot of times a lot of cct's are jtacs as well as and that's like tac p's or jtacs so like having a jtac on the ground i don't care what you like who you are having a jtac on the ground with you is to me extremely important um and then special reconnaissance, like that kind of speaks for itself. And then having us as like medics and everything, we start building our own teams and start having missions incorporated that, or we just keep going with what we're doing a lot of times and just start focusing heavier on sending uh, PJs from units, onesie, twosies out to, you know, 18, like the, the Green Berets, like ODAs or, or those teams, Rangers and stuff, and start attaching with those teams and using our skills to implement on the team with them and help them out while they're there too. Interesting. Is there talk of that doing some like adjacent work with, with those forces? Yeah. So we do, we, we are doing that a whole, a, a whole bunch right now. It's like a lot of times it's more you deploy, you get out there. Um, the teams will send like a few guys from the, where we're sitting on CSAR. So like just our search and rescue. And you'll have a lot of times where you have too many, you have more guys than you need. So the guys that aren't needed will send out to these units like Rangers and ODAs, whoever requests us like help support. And we'll go out there and we'll attach with them as medics. A lot of times these guys want, they want medics, more medics. And so it's pretty easy for us to get on there. And like I said, JTACs, like to CCTs, to tech bees, everybody wants them. So they go out and attach to a lot of teams. Um, I mean, that's the main role of tech P they go out there and they attach with the army, but we have what's called the, the two, four, which is our like tier one unit. And those guys are constantly doing that. Like that's their, that's what they do where sometimes stateside, we can get a, a two, four will say like, Hey, we don't have the bodies. We got all our guys out right now. We need a guy from one of the units. So whether that's a guard reserve unit or uh, the Moody DM or Vegas units, they'll send a guy there and they'll actually go spend two weeks with that team and they'll train up with that team. And if that team's like this dude's solid, we'll send, we'll go, you'll go out with them. And if you're not solid, like get sent back and they'll bring in another guy. 
how can you be an Air Force PJ reserve? Because it's such extensive training. Yeah, so these guys are put on essentially active duty status throughout the pipeline. And then um, they are they're still for another year after they graduate, they're still like permanent party there, like essentially on active duty status until they get through a year in their, in their five level upgrade. And then they can go back to that, um, or like reserve traditional reserve, a TR role. And so they're, they're still getting used from them. And a lot of times like the reserve or guard units, like they're, they're mainly like a lot of times the state stuff. So like up in Portland, the Portland reserves do a lot of, a lot of work and, and same with the guard out on actually like Mount hood yeah. out there and they'll do the civilian rescue portion of it. Like we'll get it sometimes active duty, but a lot of times you'll see it as the, the guards, the reserves. Yeah. We went to like our a hearts, you know, help advanced helicopter rescue summer school. And we had a couple of PJs who run that course and both of those guys were reserve PJs out of Portland and they just, pretty oh, much nice. talked. yeah. So it's, it's kind of cool. They just talked about like rescues they did in Alaska, I guess they like deployed out of like a, Sounded like a big, like C-130 or something, like doing like jumps into the water from, I don't know what that's about. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, I mean, the Alaska unit, that's like, if you want to, if you want to go be a PJ, you want to go do what on paper is, is what we do. Like that's the Alaska unit for sure. Those guys get some pretty awesome stuff. Like the, that, that rescue they just did in like a couple of years, I think it's a couple of years now, maybe a year. They jumped in um, from a dude that was in, involved in a bear attack got mauled by a bear so they ended up jumping in for that one which is pretty cool because like you don't see a lot of jump missions right um which is cool but that's that's a, like you hear it all the time you guys are like you want to do the actual like the whole pj mission that you see on paper and everything like go to alaska uh yeah you say on paper that's the that's the mission but like isn't that more like you know that's that's more like search and rescue in the civilian world right yeah, I mean, like our, our primary role being CSAR is like search and rescue. Like you see, just being like combat, a lot of times we're out there. But but right nowadays, it's just not. That's not happening. There's not a whole bunch of pilot punch outs. There's not a whole lot of um, planes going down. Like it happens still. It just happened, but it's not like this huge thing anymore. So we're kind of stuck in a like we go and deploy and we're kind of stuck there, just sitting there like all right, well, we're here, you know, and it's not happening. So there's not a whole lot of search and rescue going on. Yes, it does still happen. But just not as much, like, especially back when we were talking, like, history, back in Vietnam, like, that was just every, everything was that. Right. But nowadays, not so much. So what was this case? This, ca- this case is you, like, a Air Force PJ jumped out to assist, like, a grizzly attack? Yeah, no. So, yeah. So, to the guy, I don't know the whole details of the story, really, but I do like the guy got attacked by a grizzly. He was able to like call it in or get help, or he was with somebody that called it in. I think they had a, they had a, 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 a snowmobile out there with them. And the, the PJs, because of how far out they were, the PJs, the quickest way to them was they jumped out. So, they did a DBSL jump. So they just did like a, uh, a double, double back static line. So they just essentially like a static line jump, but with a free fall parachute, they jumped out. They, they got to basically close enough to the guy and they walked into him and they started doing their medical treatment and then they got out. I don't know exactly. I don't remember how they got out. Um, but yeah, so they got out They like, that was pretty recently and you don't hear jump missions all that often. Like, so, it's, you know, that's, that's your, that's your PGA thing right there. You're like, Oh, I'm gonna go jump in and save the day. Right. Like that's, you know, what everybody wants to do. So that's the place to do it. They're doing a whole bunch of, you know, Arctic survival, actual rescues and stuff too. So that's the place to go do it. As far as like deployments, like the standard CSAR is just not, it's it still happens, but it's just not as much as it, as it used to be. That's cool. Where, where was this in Alaska? Do you know? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I could I could research the like for for you guys. I could research this like pretty quickly. Um, I'll just hit up a couple of my buddies and I'll I'll send you guys offline. Like I'll send you the the link and the details of it if you like do oh, sure. want to know oh, yeah, about maybe it. Maybe we can get in touch with them. Yeah. Yeah, because it's pretty. It's a pretty good one. 
I mean, we can talk about the Tamara rescue if you guys want. Like, yeah, let's go, let's go into that because if not, yeah. Yeah, so the, the Tamara rescue happened like just a little bit before I got to the unit, but it was actually like our unit, the 48th and Coast Guard. So there was, uh, I think it was, there was two vessels and there were, there were uh, like Mexican uh, fishing boats and the crane on one of the boats like had a malfunction. The whole thing just collapsed. Like, so the, the fishing net got stuck on the prop of the boat. The boat couldn't run. It ended up having... Like three people got injured from it, two of which had some serious injuries between just like head injuries and, and like legs and some bleeding and stuff. And so they were like 700 miles or so like just a, a far way, like two days or three days or whatever from shore or from port, like to get back. So they had that like, so Coast Guard went out there and was out there doing Coast Guard things. And then the, the, PJs from here and the C-130 from here flew out um, from Tucson. And actually those guys jumped in uh, with PJs and, and, a, and one of our docks here at the unit. So they actually did a tandem jump with the docks. The docks strapped up to one of the, the J's and they jumped them in. Yeah, pretty cool. So then they got on. on Where is that offshore? Of? You said Alaska? No, no, no. This was off of, uh, I think like like just straight out of San Diego area. Okay. Like, right on. Like, yeah, Mexico, Mexico, Southern California area. Yeah. Seven more miles off course, off coast. And those guys, yeah. So they jumped in, they got on board. And then like the, the so for us, like team members, the junior guys, like we're the medics, you're the medic as like the junior guy. So the, the medics started treating our doc was there as like, Hey, cause he's a doc. He's going to be the best, you know, for those, for those, those, uh, those patients. And, um, so they started treating the ducks kind of watching them and, and they're doing their thing and they ended up, you know, saving those guys. And it was, it was a really big thing. It was pretty cool, especially coming out of Tucson, being able to fly out there and do a jump mission on that boat and working alongside Coast Guard. It was pretty cool. Um, definitely had a lot of like AARs after that, that was beneficial um, with some things that just went on with it. But yeah, it was, pretty, it was pretty cool. That was recent. That was recent, about a year ago, about a year and a half. You said definitely got a lot of ARs. What's that? Yeah, just after actions, like. Oh yeah. Just some good lessons learned. Yeah. Yeah. That is pretty gnarly. That's yeah. cool. Yeah, we just call it a debrief. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Sorry. Lessons. My bad. Lessons learned. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. So I mean, you must be pretty psyched. Are Are you Are you trying to? So I mean, it sounds like you're trying to get deployed, like whenever you get the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. I definitely do because I need, like, I want to further like my progression medically and like eventually like I'm hoping to grow and become P PA eventually, maybe possibly. So I want, you know, it's like the worst thing in the world because you don't want to hope for anybody to have this day, but at the same time, like I, like you want that practice, you want that hands-on experience, real world, making a difference in treating and working on people. Um, Cause there's only so much you get through training. So like I do, cause I am a junior guy. Like I'm probably, I'm one of the newer guys at the unit for sure. So like, I do want to go out there. Like my mom and my girlfriend are going to hate that. I say that, but like, like I do want to get out there and do what I've been trained to do. So it's kind of frustrating to get like, you know, stuck stateside and just sitting here staying and waiting for potentially getting deployed. I'm, I'm definitely asking, um, like, Hey guys, like send me out, like put me on the team. Let me augment. Let me go work with these guys. I'll work, you know, I'll work my butt off and I'll prove to you that like I can do it. And then I'll prove it to them that I can be with them. And that's like what all like young guys are doing, should be doing, are doing. Um, cause right now there's just not a lot going on. Yeah. What are you doing? Like on a daily basis right now? Like, uh, like a day, a day in life, kind of like when you go to work, what are you doing? So when I go to work, I do a lot of uh, coordinating with the, the, so it's the 55th, the helicopter unit out here. Um, and I'm spending weeks, like I'll spend a week planning and then I'll spend a week doing like, that training that I have planned. So like here coming up quick, like we're going to do some just training on helos and stuff. We're working on like upgrades for guys. So get, getting guys like an element leader, 
or getting guys like the AIE masters. So just being able to, to, to run the helo as far as the back of the helo, as far as the PJ side goes. So like running the fast rope, running the stokes, running all that equipment that you have running. What's a stoke? Stokes. It's just a litter. Oh, oh stokes just make sure like everything is like correctly, like staged, everything's safe. Everybody's clipping in correctly and safely. Um, and running those like insertions and, you know, to get in and out of the bird or to get in and out of your, your, uh, infill actually. Is that like a, is that a more advanced, uh, qualification for a PJ or is that like pretty standard? It's pretty, like, it's pretty early on. You get it pretty early on. Like some guys get it right out of the pipeline. Some guys get it on their first deployment. Some guys get it later. Like it's, it's, it should be something everybody gets pretty soon after just because it's, it's an important role and it's important that there's more eyes than just one pair. That's making sure everyone in the back of that bird is safe. So like we do want guys quickly to get it. We're like, you know, you get, you get jams and stuff that, that happens up a little bit later, especially like free fall jump master. And that's a little later. What's, your, um, what's your ultimate outcome as a PJ? Like, are you trying to, you know, become like, are you, are you trying to retire or? Yeah, I really don't know yet, um, honestly, because I do, like I do want to stay in, but I'm just not sure if I'm going to be doing active or if I'm going to get out and go do Garter Reserve. Like I worked with Portland, um, and I got a taste of what reserve life is at least on a deployment side, and that was kind of kind of cool. Yeah, the, um, those guys kind of seem like they're living the dream in Portland. Um, yeah. It sounds like they just get sent to all the schools, and they you know. Aren't yeah. Doing- yeah, they do. They, yeah, those are some good dudes too. Like, I, you know, I love working with them. Um, but like for me, like I do want to further um, becoming like like I want to further medically. So I do want to become more than just a medic. So I'm hoping I can get out and do like guard or reserve, and or maybe potentially staying in active and going outside and doing school for PA and becoming that. I've also heard stories of guys get out entirely become a PA and then come back as an active duty guy, um, which honestly, they, then they can, you know, we might as both, which would be awesome. But that'd be, if you get out, I think it's like, man, I can't remember. I think it's like five years or something. I don't know the number exactly, but if you get out and you haven't been a PJ for that long, you have to go back through PJU. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the that, must be, that must be funny, yeah. though. It's like going back through high school. Yeah. <laughs> the, couple classes before my PJU class, there was a guy that that's what he did. And that's how I know about it because he was a prior PJ that is now going PJ again. That's unreal. But then you get a, you get a bunch of prior PJs. Like I had a prior PJ on my team was seven level PJ, you know, like in for a while. And now he's decided to go officer and he's going pro. So he's got to go back through PJU. So he was with our team, which is nice as like a dude that's never been a PJ and you're going through PJU and you're like, Oh, I got a guy that knows all about this yeah or you know i don't want to give him too much credit but yeah he did yeah he's good. he's good pj he's a good dude i wonder what that feels like to go through something so challenging twice you know it must be easier the second time i mean it's Maybe. not like it's not it's not like in doc all over again you know it's it is there are still physical challenges and then a lot of these guys like they're a lot older right so they're looking at these the, uh, the instructors at pju and a lot of these dudes are really good buddies with the instructors because they went through a lot of times with each other. And so they'll get dropped and they're looking at their buddies and like, come on, come on, man. <laughs> yeah. But they're still doing like everything with us. It's from a lot of them, you know, it is challenging, but at the same time, like they're going, they're going through again, but they're going through a whole different side of it going officer versus PJ. And when you get to PJU, there is some separations in certain phases where there's some brand new things. Those, those guys are learning for sure. Yeah. And that is, that is funny. Like to be going through that with your peers, but they're now more or less your supervisors as your yeah. instructors. Yeah. Um, like even in boot camp in the coast guard boot camp, there's those folks that were prior either coast guard or prior service. And they're going through kind of like a fast track boot camp in like seven days or something like that. But it was really funny. I remember we were like in the uniform, like distribution center and you know, we're kind of scared. We're brand new, fresh. Most of us are young, uh, getting yelled at. And then there's this other CC for this, like 
these prior service folks <laughs> and you see them in line they just got their uniform and yeah. uh he's trying to like chew them out and like he's yelling and you could see like half of them there's not many of them but like half of them were kind of like like smirking and like well i think one girl was actually cracking up she was like <laughs> <laughs> and and even this the company commander had a hard time like keeping his composure and smile he was like oh you're gonna laugh in my face but he was like don't you laugh at me <laughs> it was quite quite interesting to watch it's like we get off you know. guys too like we had a guy that was prior again navy like aviation aviation rescue divers what they guys those guys are but he went through that became like he had a line number for e8 in the navy got got out of the navy to go air force to go pj and he lost a couple stripes going to Air Force, but he was graduating. When he graduated, he was 40 years old. Jesus. Yeah, went through everything. Graduated at 40 years old. And, man, that guy was – he was brittle. It was pretty funny. He's a good He's a good guy. That's pretty cool. I'm shocked that Air Force would take him, though. It just seems kind of old for a lot of that kind of training, you know, yeah, as far as just, like the investment. He had a long – I think, like, the cutoff's, what, 35? Like, I think okay. – 35 when he when he came up like he it right. took him took it because he got super he got really injured he broke his back so he was off you know <laughs> he had a football accident he broke his back and then I was recovered from that that's kind of badass <laughs> freaking four years old yeah it's freaking super old uh it was, he, was, he was a good guy i never let him not live that down is 40 years old like that's so old to be graduating <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. it's an impressive story it must have been cool to have him around you know have the yeah. salty sailor around he was super salty it was really fun to have him around he was very yeah. angry he had he had um he had these quotes that would just come out of him that you like he used to always say like I'd be shaking like a dog shit and razor blades <laughs> just like what man <laughs> like what is that yeah. <laughs> Because he's like always shaking. He'd be giving IVs and he's just like shaking. <laughs> and he's always going, but he's shaking. <laughs> well, that's right. Because you guys are NREMT, so like in, in paramedics. So like you're yeah. nationally registered paramedics. Um, but on top of that, like don't you guys have even like higher powers as far as like what you can do out in the field? Yeah. So like we go through that paramedic, like I was telling you guys, and then we end up going through dirt med, which is like the PJ med and our protocols start to get a little bit bigger. We're like our docs are now we're under their license and we're practicing under their license and doing what they allow us to do. So that, that expands like some of the skill sets we can do, such as like finger finger thoracotomies and like chest tube, putting in a chest tube and and certain things like that. We're like, and giving certain drugs, we're like normal, like, Civilian, paramedic, like you, you're definitely not giving antibiotics at this feeling paramedic. You're definitely not cutting some into somebody's chest and putting a tube in there, like not doing that, any of that. So it we do get a little more leniency on things we can do. Um not a whole lot though. But that's always that one that everyone knows about is the chest tube, the fact that Air Force PJs can put in chest tubes. Um Yeah, and it's honestly not like you know, you hear story. I hear stories about it all the time. I go through all these courses, and it's not like a finger does like the same as a chest tube. And chest tubes are in a very prolonged field care scenario, like in a very prolonged scenario. Like, yeah, chest tubes for sure. But a lot of times, especially like PJs, like where we get in and we get out, we get guys out. Like, if a dude's that messed up and your your uh, your darts are really not working, like you're gonna go to a finger and it, and it works great, and it's gonna work for what we need. What, what can you explain for the viewers what the process is like of using a chest tube or a finger? Yeah. Um, so like we have a protocols, right? You got to follow by the book. You got to know by the book, like specifically, like you got to dart twice, two unsuccessful darts. But a lot of times with these darts, like if it works, regardless if it works for a couple seconds or for 30 minutes, like it still works. It's still successful. So a lot of guys will think like, Oh, I darted him. It worked. I darted him. It worked, but now he's bad. Like, then I go on, like people get like 30 darts, 30 freaking needles in their chest just to like help. And then, but like, if not, like if that's not working, nothing's working there. Like our progression for the protocol is like, we'll move into a finger thoracotomy, which will just 
basically like right here on the guy. We'll cut into them. And you'll use these, what they call them like Kelly for, for steps, these cl Kelly clamps. They're like little curved Kellys. Um, and you'll like cut to the bone, to the rib. And then you actually punch through the pleura. So like this little like, it's like this, like a balloon, that kind of lining that just lines your, your thoracic cavity and your lungs. And you'll just punch through that. And then like, you'll let all that air escape. So the lung can then re-expand. Um, and past that, like, if that's not working, a lot of times too, like you can get blood out of like hemothoraxes and stuff and get blood out. But if you get a so you would use it, you would use it for that as well. I would. Cause then like what you can do is like you put your finger, like you put your finger in there and kind of like well, try to spread the ribs so that air can escape. And you'll actually like, you can roll that patient and like you'll roll them. And if the patient has a hemo, like it's not going to come pouring out, but like blood will, blood will come out or it should just based off of gravity. So blood will come out and then you'll know like, Hey, he's got a hemo, you know, and you can treat that. And then, and then past that, like, if that's not working, like you can put your tube in and you'll just take another, you know, you'll take a clamp and you'll clamp your tube and then you'll just feed the tube in. Um, and like, you know, you're just trying to get to like, the air is going to go high, right? The blood's going to go low just off gravity and everything. So like, you're kind of trying to figure out where to put that tube based off of those things. Mm -hmm. But then you have to set up like we what we use is a Heimlich valve where you can use the, the latex like glove as a finger, as a, like a valve, a one-way valve. So like air and blood gets out, but no air comes back in. But a lot of times they say like it doesn't work, especially in the environments we're in. It's just super dirty. It's super like, it can be very harmful for the patient. Mm -hmm. So in those like non-prolonged field care scenarios, like it's just, it's a lot. Not to mention like the way we seal that back up, like, best practice is sutures, you know, and everything and doing that. Um, but a lot of times like time crunches or like you're under fire or something's happening, like you're going to throw a chest seal on that and seal it up that way. And then you'll later on go down and you'll fix all that stuff. Fix anything that like. Was Wait, so you guys are also trained to do sutures out in the field? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Well, wherever. I mean, we have like, I'll have like a suture kit with me um if i'm doing a suture in the field i'm definitely in a prolonged scenario i'm not going to be on the x doing sutures you know stitching somebody up like it's just not i'm not going to do that but i will throw a chest seal on because those things are super sticky like a chest seal is basically like freaking insanely great duct tape like it just true it'll yeah. stick yeah it'll stick really well um, I'll just slap those on. A lot of guys will just slap those on for like efficient, like just quickly. It's nice. a lot quicker what, to pull someone. What's the scenario where you're saying you, you might stick 30 needles into a guy? So a lot of times, like just your, your breathing alone, like if your lungs punctured, your lung is going to be pushing air out if it's right. So if like you put a chest seal on a guy or whatever, you close that hole, like besides darting, you could also burp this, like I'll go into it, but like you throw a chest seal on, now you're closing that. So if that lung is punctured, you're guaranteeing another pneumo, you're guaranteeing that pressure to build up in his thoracic cavity and pushing down on that lung through that pressure of the air. So you'll redart and let that air escape. And then it'll happen again. And then you'll redart and that air will escape and then it'll, it'll, re, it'll build back up. Or like another tactic, another like way to do it is you can burp your chest seals or you can have vented chest seals. But if you don't have vented chest seals, you can burp your, your chest seal. And in theory, they all escape. A lot of times like the fascia, just the tissue is going to close itself. It's going to move mm -hmm. around and it will close that hole on its own. So just burping or a vented chest seal is a lot of times not going to work. So you'll have to just re-dart, throw in another dart, let that air escape. And then it'll just keep, re it'll just keep building. But typically a pneumothorax is, is on one side, right? So you would keep redarting on that one side, just in different locations. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, depend, depending on the injury. Yeah. Like let's say it was just a GSW through and through. So you clearly know it's not bouncing around anywhere. It's straight through. Like, you know, you'll throw your chest seals on a lot of times pneumos won't develop. Cause like we're using five, five, six, like these five, five, six or seven, six, two rounds, like, it's not going to develop that quickly. It's going to take 30, 45 minutes a, a lot of times for those. Like if you're there and you see your dude, your buddy get shot, 
it'll just probably be around 30, 45 minutes for it to develop. So you'll put a chest seal on, you'll monitor the guy, you'll wait and see how he trends his vitals and, and how he's breathing, just talking to him. And then you'll move into a dart. And like we like we can go here or we can go like here. This is like where we're going now um, in the military in general, just because of like being able to keep the kit on for the guy. Um, it's a little bit safer for just, you know, say brand new medics, like, or just dudes just learning. Like if you're going here, like the whole like mid clavicular line, a lot of times guys will move inside it. And then you're starting to risk puncturing the heart, which is definitely not good. So like we've moved into just doing it on the anterior axillary line, like on your side, like just underneath the armpit will not puncture on the sides. And like, you'll just kind of slowly either move up, move down a little bit, maybe now move into the mid clavicular area. Or a lot of times too, like if you're, you go out there and you got four, four darts, you got, you know, four needle decompression, like you got four of them. Um, what you can do is, which is not good practice. Like I'm definitely not saying this is best practice, but you can pull that out, rethread your needle and reuse on the same patient, of course. But like, this is like, this is like real bad case scenario. You don't have the equipment. They're just not getting better. I have nothing like this is an option. Definitely yeah. not good practice. And it's like in a clinical setting, like that's very bad. <laughs> like you're going to get in trouble for that for sure. But like, if that's what you come down to, that's what you, that's what you have. Hmm. All right. Let's, let's ask a more fun question. What's like the scariest thing um, you may be asked to do as a PJ? Like personally, what's, what's your fear in the field? I hate jumping. Like, I don't mind jumping out of the plane. I hate landing. I freaking hate it. Like, I hate landing because you're always getting hurt. Not injured. You always get hurt, but, like, a lot of times you're going to get injured, too. I hate that. But if we're, like, out in a combat setting or out, like, real world, like, I mean, I don't care who you are. You're probably going to get scared if you're involved in, a, in like, a, in a tick or, like, if people are shooting at you, like, you're going to get scared. Like, it's just, I would say that would be scary. Of course. Well, that, that's why I was trying to get into that, that mindset of a, of a PJ because it is a different uh, realm. Like you ask most rescue swimmers and the reason they want to join is they'll always say like, I wanted the challenge of an elite military program, but I wanted the ability to save lives versus take them. And an Air Force PJ is also tasked with saving lives while being tasked, tasked with combat. Um, yes, yeah, so not tasked with like going out there you know, taking lives. Like we're there for, especially like, even if you augment or you're with a team, you're tier one and you're with a team, like they're kicking doors down and they, that, you know, they're doing that. They're door kicking for sure. But like your task as your medic primary, you're going to, at the end of the day, like you're, you're going to be involved in the fight. Of course, like you're going to put your gun up and you're going to fire. Um, and you're going to shoot at anything that shoots back at you for sure. But you're, ultimately to me, and this is like, everybody has a different opinion, but to me, like you're ultimately you're the medic and I'm there to be a medic. I'm not there to just go out there and kill people. Like I'm going to go out there and treat the dudes I need to treat. And a lot of times, like there are a lot of stories of like PJ's also treating the enemy. You know, that happens a lot. Yeah. Interesting. But, yeah. Do, do you know, know, do you know stories like that yourself? Not enough to like speak on them, speak on them. Like, I mean, guys come back, they're not like guys don't really talk about what they've done, what they saw a lot of times, especially like if it was a real no shit, like bam kind of scenario. But like, yeah, you, you, you hear it throughout, like, you know, the triple down and everybody talking about it. Like you do end up hearing stories, but yeah, not enough for me to talk on it. Here, here's like a probably stupid question, but you say like uh, peaches have helped the enemy um you know like in world war ii technically like the paramedics or the the medics are not to be shot at they're like people there to relief and to to assist and like is that within the geneva i don't know um but there's no such thing for like the pjs right like you guys don't have a big old cross yeah, just, your... yeah that's the that's a big difference between us is like we don't have that red cross and we do carry weapons like your, your medics with the red cross like on the birds on themselves like they're not carrying you know m4s on them they're not strapped up with m4s running out there like 
that's what differentiates us is we do have that. We have that capability of we are tactically trained. Like we go through tactics portions, we go through courses. Once you get in, you go out and train with rangers, you know, do and you know, CEOs and everybody and you know, do a CQB training, do all that stuff. And that kind of different that sets us apart from just your standard like medic go out there and have a big red cross on yourself. And it's just we yeah. So a lot of times we don't do a lot of CSART roles we get that taken away from us by your standard medics because they don't they don't necessarily need like that force the pj force or whatever or whatever gotcha yeah now that being said the stupid question was in afghanistan and iraq would medics be shot at you think in a in a war type or like a hostile type scenario yeah uh, i think anybody gets like i don't think they care i don't think they yeah care. You're an American. Uh, it doesn't matter who you are as an American. I think you're going to get shot. Like you- when I was out there, there was there was like not not me personally, but like there was stuff going on, and like you know, it just it shows you that like a lot of times they really don't give a shit mm-hmm. who it is. Like they're gonna if you're an American or you look like an American, you're going to be shot at for sure. Hmm. Do you think there was a war where the medic? system was honored as far as not getting shot at no not at all i don't i don't i mean i don't know like i think i think people honored it certain people honored it but ultimately like i think those medics at some point or other in world war ii were definitely definitely shot at maybe certain people were like okay i'm gonna honor this like just their um their morale or like that's you know, their mentality, that's what they decided. But not, I don't think everyone, I think most of the time they're going to get shot at. Hmm. Wow. Well, it's a really cool job. Um, you do, what would you, uh, like parting words as far as anybody trying to go down the, the Air Force PJ route, you know, what would you recommend? As far as like the, the pipeline and training, um, before you go in, definitely train up on just your cows and running and swimming and stuff like just so you can get through it. Just get through that first phase, that initial like what is now ANS, just get through that. And once you're through that, it's just going to be like just a sunrise all of a sudden. You're like, wow, this is so much better. Not only that, but once you get through the pipeline itself, it gets even better because you're still dealing with a lot of stuff through the pipeline but once you get through that just get through those first two to three years just embrace the suck really ultimately just get through it and then life's gonna get a lot better and you're gonna really enjoy uh the pj career any any fuck ups or mistakes that you personally did um you know looking back on it that you would do differently i mean yeah i had fuck ups all the way through um I would definitely go into like from the beginning before even go through basic. I would, I would, if I go back, I would try to learn and, and understand PJs a little bit more because I was a little caught off guard, not knowing anything about them going in. Um, and then moving past that, like <clears throat> I wish I could have developed better relationships with these other courses. Like when you go through, seer or if you go through airborne starting to to like network and building relationships with outside branches other branches sister services and stuff and then because like ultimately at the end of the day it's always about who you know there was a couple guys i met at airborne that were like cca whiskeys and other medics like and just becoming friends with them was super beneficial like if i would have done that a little more maybe there'd be more people i could know and i can like grow more as a PJ just from based off the people that I know. That was a big learning point for me, but yeah, I mean, everybody's got their own things, but yeah, I mean, you're going to, there's a lot of fuck ups you're going to have, but you got to just understand that and get through it. Hey, last, last little curiosity question too. There's always jokes, uh, you know, inter-service about different boot camps, some being harder than others. I think it's, it's kind of, unargued that marines since it is longer is three months and it's it's drilling in that that marine core mindset tends to be perceived as like the the harder boot camp but the air force boot camp is often 
portrayed as like the the pajama party <laughs> uh, boot camp. What what is your perspective on it? Yeah, I yeah. mean, really, we spent most of the day sitting in a in a classroom. Like, it was it was. I mean, this is my own thought on it. This is not anybody else's, but it was a joke. Like, come on, like interesting. Actually, test and, and test like test people. Like, so there are some things that they do, just like. They, a lot of these guys, and this is true for across the board, but a lot of these guys do know how to manipulate. And if you like, some people just can't handle it, they will get manipulated. And, and it, that's pretty rough for, you know, but that's across the board. Other side of that, man, all we did was sit in a classroom and go for a jog every now and then. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, Brendan, I actually, Cody, do you got anything? No, I got nothing. Yeah. Well, uh, Brendan, thanks so much for coming on. Um, okay. Yeah, really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks for it. Take care, man. Great. So we love having different people from different services. Uh, Air Force PJ, Brennan Deckard. Uh, hopefully we can get some more gnarly, like, elite military folks, you know? Yeah, well, we got Navy Rescue Summer possibly soon. Oh, yeah. 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 What about, like, a Marine Recon? That'd be cool. I don't know any. Like, I don't even know one. What about a dive? Obviously don't. What? What about smoke jumper? We need some smoke jumpers on oh, the that'd podcast. Be cool. yeah. yeah. I think I actually, um, no, I don't know one. I know a guy training for that, but actually yeah, he doesn't do it. That'd I just cool. watched that movie uh, on Netflix with the with the smoke jumpers. It was so good. It wasn't really? that good, but it was pretty good. Yeah, they punch. Here. No, I won't ruin it for you guys tuning in. Yeah. Yeah, I will. They all die. They all die, Cody. They all die. They wrap themselves in their little tinfoil, like little cozy what do you call it sleeping bags and they're like let's hope and pray and they stick their heads in the dirt and they die really (laughs) yeah and it's a true story jesus yeah Um, man it's hardcore paying more than thirty thousand dollars a year what's it called uh smoke jumper or smoke jumper or the hot shots those are two different no that's they they kind of serve this similar yeah i think it is called hot shots maybe oh nice it's big actors in there that's intense Uh, yeah anyway uh, so please go to the rescue to, to join the strike that we have going on for the, the pays of the smoke jumpers. We think it is outrageous that it is so small. <laughs> so riot. join there, join the, <laughs> and vote today. Yeah. We, we recorded this podcast just before the, uh, the election. So tomorrow, either open. president yeah. Trump or president Biden will be in office but that's not what's important what's important is you vote for the smoke jumpers who are being paid pennies on the dollar for risking their lives in their little thermal sleeping bags thank you for what you do it's been a rough year all right uh, yeah. <laughs> let's get to uh what we have going on in the risk storm mindset yeah yes yeah, so the podcast is humming along but we'll kind of talk about some of the so some of the stuff we got you know we got Did you some say product. humming along Coming along. <laughs> so we have a couple courses that we're going to talk about today. Um, let's talk about your course first. How to hold your breath like a helicopter rescue swimmer. Um, yeah, here's the deal. Everyone's still hitting us up about water confidence. And yes, that is the most challenging thing. If you're going the Air Force PJ route, probably even the Navy SEAL route, that's that's in the rescue swimmer route. That's definitely a challenge. And if you're a free diver that's trying to get better, then you know this course would be very beneficial to you. Um, but yeah, we're we're not planning on on coming out just yet with a, a water confidence training because my course, uh, the hold your breath like a helicopter rescue swimmer course, is really encapsulating of everything you need to know as far as the knowledge uh, surrounding breath holding. Um, so the course involves you know, how to expand your lung capacity techniques before you dive. Cause like a lot of people don't understand that it's not necessarily what you do once you're underwater. It's what you do prior to. And I don't just mean training. I mean like your preparatory breathing. So it goes into that. That's a whole chapter in itself. Then once you are underwater, the technique to move efficiently with or without fins, uh, two different sections. So this is a video course. It's available at the rescue slash breathe. So again, if you just go into the rescue and just check out our programs, you can find the hold your breath, like a 
helicopter rescue swimming program and uh, get your knowledge on as well as as trainings and uh, apnea tables so you can really develop you know how long you can uh, hold your breath and yeah we we had some people take the course and I think it's pretty cool watching uh, the comments somebody said like they they've held their breath now for like three minutes which is not nothing to laugh at so um, reveal it's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. It's really cool. I think, I mean, my, uh, I can't, I can't, you gotta, you gotta get the course if you want to see my end result at the end uh, where I hold my breath. So I won't (laughs) spoiler alert. That's like the last chapter is they're going to buy a course just for that. (laughs) Just to watch me hold my breath at the top of a a 14, I think it was like a 14,000 foot mountain. So the altitude played different, not to make excuses, but it really does. Uh, I I wanted to test it myself. So that's why I did that. But um, so check it out. The hold your breath like a helicopter rescue swimmer program. Cool. Yep. So we got that. And then um, a course that we also wrote pretty recently and released a couple months ago is the 1.5 mile timed run training. So a lot of courses, you know, rescue swimmer school, we have the one and a half mile run. Navy SEALs do the one and a half mile run. PJs do the one and a half mile run. So it's just a course that's designed to get that run, you know, to the to where it needs to be. Um, generally, I'd say like, if you take the core, it's hard to like, you know, guess results, but generally like you can see like a big kind of drop. So if you're running like a 12 minute mile and a half and you take the course, I would guess if you are sticking to the workouts and kind of hitting the, uh, the projections kind of in the course, you could probably drop it down into like the tens ideally. And then, you know, when you get into like the nines, it's going to be harder to drop the time down. Like typically someone running like a 12 minute mile and a half wants to get into the tens. Someone's running in like a, like a nine, something wants to get into the eights. So with this course, if you hit the workouts, you're, pretty likely to do that. I would say, um, obviously like, it's like kind of like a one-time thing. There's a lot of diminishing returns. So if you take it one time, you'll definitely like see a huge improvement. You're a mile and a half, you know, PJ's apparently it's a nine thirty seven. What do you say? Nine thirty seven for his some minute. around there. Yeah. Pretty fast. So this course would definitely help with that. Um, you can basically stack these workouts on top of any other training program you're going through. So if you like have a strength training program, water confidence, water conditioning program, and you want to get, just get faster and want a specialized course for that, you can take the workouts from this training. Cause they're all, there's no strength or anything. In it. It's just speed work, aerobic conditioning, building aerobic base. You can stack those workouts in whatever training program you're on, on top of, or you can stack this program on top of those workouts. So it's a good course. How does it feel uh, yourself personally running a mile and a half now as a as an older gentleman now? I did a mile recently. We had an RSM train challenge, so I did the mile. And I got like, I think 530, 540 or something. So I would guess, I'm, I should do it pretty soon here and kind of see what I get. I would, it feels about the same, honestly. Like, I don't feel much difference, you know, between like freaking when I was in summer school at like 19 now, like, I, if anything, I'm faster now than I was then, you know, so. Are you heavier though? Yeah, heavier. Mm, that's cool. I'm heavier like probably 20 faster. pounds. Yeah, it's just, I think it just comes down to that building that aerobic base, you know. The more you train, you just get more fit. Uh, but we'll see. Yeah. Maybe I'll post a one and a half mile run time soon. Um, uh, the RSM training circle on Facebook. Check that out. We do have a lot of different services now that have joined in, yeah. joined in and are, are communicating and sharing information. So check that out and also check out our weekly challenges where, you know, Cody just spoke about the, uh, the mile run. That was kind of cool seeing those, those numbers. And then, uh, baskets in that class or in that, in that group, we had a guy who ran like a five, almost like a five minute, I think like pretty fast. Yeah. Yeah. People crushing it. And then we also have the, uh, the pull up challenge right now, which is pretty, it could be better, y'all. It could be, I mean, myself included, it could be better. Yeah. So, well, we, so we get on 20. the. We just got a 20. So. Oh, we got a 20 pull ups. Three hours All right. ago. We got All right. 20. I take it back. I take it back. I take it back. That the, yeah, it's people are stepping their game up. So, if you think you beat 20 pull ups on the challenge, join the RSM uh, training circle on Facebook. Um, yep. Great. What about coaching? Uh, yeah, coaching. If you want to, if you want me to coach you, just send us a DM. I don't have like a coaching, um, tab on the, on the website, just because I kind of want to vet the person who's trying to contact me. Basically I'm only going to coach people who are training for rescue summer school. So if you're trying to join the coach right now, like everyone I coach is everyone I coach right now, besides one and the person who I don't who I coach now, who's not training to be rescue summer, is just kind of grandfathered in. But if you're trying to be a rescue swimmer, 
and you want me to coach you, you can just send me a DM or send an email to rsmguide at gmail.com and I'll ask some questions and see if you're a good fit. And then we'll go from there. Um, but yeah, both, both the guys I'm training right now who are joining the Coast Guard, one guy is in the, in the Coast Guard, is in the NX program, and the other guy is going to join. He's got like a boot camp date for uh, the end of the year. They're doing well, and um, I think they're going to be solid candidates. But, you know, it's always hard to tell um, until you get to right summer school, but time will tell. So, yeah, just send me a DM. Right All right. Lastly on the agenda is the Wildertainment Podcast. Nice. Oh, boy, if you guys haven't checked this one out yet. It just released yesterday. Um, so check that out. It's still under the Rescue Swimmer Mindset podcast. So it's it's a series that we're starting um, all geared about around wilderness entertainment. So anything related to survival stories or just pretty phenomenal stories of, of just challenges out in the outdoors, uh, whether that be rock climbing, that be canoeing, kayaking, survival uh, the s- next week is already recorded, and that is with Gina Panuzzi, and she survived a helicopter crash uh, in Utah. And I think I, I talked about it briefly, but it's it's probably one of the gnarliest stories I've ever heard in my life. Uh, it was actually pretty hard to to host that podcast. So check that out. She's a phenomenal human being. Um, so that's the Wildertainment podcast, and yeah, you can listen to it right where you're listening to this if you are on any kind of podcast app but it's also going to be on youtube under wildertainment so that's like wilderness and entertainment except it's wildertainment yeah and those are going to be coming on wednesdays right wildertainment wednesdays cody wildertainment wednesdays wildertainment yeah, so wednesday subscribe to the podcast and you'll just freaking probably just get a little, little update on your phone whenever it gets uploaded so Bear with me on the first podcast, though. That was, you know, that's the introductory podcast, which just old Vinny Two Crocs that tells his own wilderness adventure story. So that one's involving a bear and waking up next to a bear. That's exciting. Yeah, check that out. (laughs) Yeah. Great. So, um, yeah, and Cody, we'll have you on as a guest with your gnarly mountain lion story. That's all we're going to say. Oh, the mountain lion one. Yeah, that'd be good. Mountain lion story. Yep. Um, so yeah, Will the Podcast. Anything else that we have for today? I think that's it. All right. Rescue Swimmer Mindset Podcast. Over. I want to be